So we're going to go ahead and take a look here at example number one and uh, see what it says here. Example one, a car manufacturer claims that when driven at a speed of 50 miles per hour on a highway, the mileage of a certain model of car has a mean of 30 miles per gallon. A consumer advocate, though, thinks that the manufacturer is overestimating that average mileage. A sample of 200 cars is taken, and the results show that there is an average of 29.8 miles per gallon with a standard deviation of 2 miles per gallon. Is there enough evidence to support the consumer advocate's claim at a 10% level of significance? So immediately, one of the things I should be able to tell, and you're seeing by what I've underlined here, is that this is clearly a problem that is asking me about an average value. Like, what's the average miles per gallon for this actual car? The manufacturer says one thing, the consumer advocate says another. So like, who would I go with? What hypothesis do I believe is most reasonable? So let's start to set up the hypotheses to see what we have. I'm still going to have an H0, but now it's going to be talking about a mu. And that's going to be squaring off against an H1, also talking about an average. Now I want to see what the consumer advocate claims. The consumer advocates, advocate thinks that the manufacturer is overestimating the mileage. And the manufacturer said that it was 30 miles per gallon. So it seems like if the consumer advocate is, believes that the mileage is being overestimated, they would think that the actual average should be less than 30, right? They would think that, oh, manufacturer, you're giving me a number that's way too high. There's no way that's right. The real average is smaller than 30. Of course, that would automatically mean that in my other hypothesis, I have exactly 30. Again, those numbers up there always are going to be the same. I would then jump to my evidence. And we have this listed out on the last page. But we can also see on the formula sheet, the different pieces of evidence that I'm going to need to grab. I'm going to need an X bar, an S, an N, and a mu zero, which technically I already have, because that's the number in the hypotheses. That's my 30. So let's see. I'm going to start by maybe stating X bar. OK, um, we took an, a sample of cars, and there was an X bar. There was a sample average. And it looks like that was 29.8 miles per gallon. There was a standard deviation of two miles per gallon. And of course, there was a value of n, which was 200 cars. That's perfect. I now want to see if my x bar is likely or unlikely to occur by random chance. So I need to figure out you know, what distribution do the x bars fall into. Well, for my checks, I can quickly see that n is clearly greater than or equal to 30. And so once I have this, I know that x bar has a d distribution. Now, there's a couple reasons here why we have this new distribution popping up, and we've never talked about this distribution before. You might recall in the last exam that x bar had a normal distribution if we met a similar check. But the difference there is we were able to determine what the mean and standard deviation were for that normal distribution based on those old formulas. But if you look at the current information that we have on this problem, we don't know the average miles per gallon for a single car. We don't know uh, the standard deviation for a single car. And so that kind of creates a slight complexity. It's why we have to change our distribution to this new distribution. For the moment, don't worry about what a t distribution is. But you can note that on the formula sheet, I'm trying to tell you that you have a t distribution by saying this is t equals, as opposed to on the other side where we had z equals. So once I know that the checks are met, I can go ahead and get ready to compute a t score, very much like a z score, just for a different distribution. Again, I'm going to create the same sort of picture that I've always created. I'm going to say there are a bunch of x bars that I could have gotten, and they line up on a number line. And they fall into the shape, not of a normal distribution, but of a t distribution. So on the picture here, I'm going to go ahead and sketch out what my t distribution looks like. Be ready. It's not a normal distribution, and so it's a, it's a different picture. Here's what my t distribution looks like. Yeah, it pretty much looks almost exactly like a normal. Um, for all practical purposes, it's uh, 
perfectly fair to just draw a standard normal curve. These things aren't identical. Um, to the naked eye, they might seem like they're identical, but I actually do something very different there. Uh, we're not going to be getting into the, a lot of the deep math and theory behind the t-distribution. So for the moment, I would just say be aware that you're working with one, even though the picture happens to be very similar. OK. Again, we know that we expect the average x bar to be 30 because, again, we're testing hypothesis 0, h0. And that says the average should be 30. So um, I know that we found a sample average of 29.8. So we found something that was a little bit below average. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to put that value on here. I'm curious if it's maybe too low. And so remember that this value over here is what we called our p-value. And I know exactly how I would find that. p-value is going to be x bar is less than 29.8. And the calculator should be able to tell me how to set up all of this. I should also be able to calculate my t-scores. And while I know that 30 has a t-score of 0, I don't know the t-score yet for the 29.8. It's really important at this time, and I didn't mention this in the previous videos, but I'll mention it now, that for every single problem that we do, uh, not just in the notes, but on the homework and when you do things on the test, I am going to ask all of these parts, literally all of them. So you see here how I have like a shaded space. I'm going to ask you to shade that space. I'm going to ask you to fill out all these numbers. I'm going to ask you to fill out the p-value is equal to and write the probability statement. So I'm not going to ask you anything more or less than what I'm asking you to do here on every in-class problem. So pay careful attention to that. If you're constantly skipping something that I'm writing down, you're not going to be ready to do that portion on the exam or on the homework, and you'll tend to lose points. So make sure that you're careful and thinking about, like, how did I come up with this probability statement? How did I know to write things that way? You want to make sure that you're doing the same thing. OK, so everything's set up and ready to go now to be ready to use the calculator. So let's go ahead and see how it works. I would click on the stat button. I would go over to tests. And according to the formula sheet, I should be looking for a specific test. Take a look at your formula sheet right now to see if you can identify what test we're supposed to be looking for in this calculator menu. Pause the video if you need to to keep looking. But the answer that we should come up with is, I want to do a t-test. If I click on this, I'll notice that there's a couple things that begin to pop up. One of the first things that I have is if I have data or stats to input. Now, you'll notice that under the data menu, it's going to ask us eventually for, do you have stuff entered into a list in our calculator? And we don't, because we didn't get like any raw data here. So I'm going to switch this over to stats right away. And you'll see that this asks for things that I definitely have. My mu0 is 30. That's from the hypotheses. My average is 29.8. My standard deviation was 2. and my n was 200. Oops, 200. The very last piece here again is my alternative hypothesis. It's a fill in the blank. Make sure you're reading it as a sentence. This is the average is not equal to 30, the average is smaller than 30, or the average is bigger than 30. Now, according to what the consumer advocate thought, we thought less than 30. When I crunch this, again, all the things pop up. I should have my H0 or my H1 right at the top. I have my t-score, which again should make sense that it's negative because I did have a value that was below average. Although according to that t-score, it doesn't look like it was very far below average, a little bit more than one jump below. The p-value was 0 0.0794. Okay. Um, and by our normal standard, that would be considered not rare because it's not under the value of 5%. But remember that alpha tells us whether or not something is rare. In this case, we wanted to use a 10% level of significance, which means that our alpha is 0.10. So for this question, we're going to say that anything that happens under 10% of the time is rare. So I would definitely say here, we did see a rare x bar. So my p-value was less than my alpha. So I got something that was rare. And when I get something that's rare, I don't think that H0 seems like a great fit anymore, and I'm going to reject it. I still want to write out my conclusion, though, in the same way we did in the last section. Here we go. I can start by saying it is rare to get a 
sample average of 29.8 by chance if the real average is 30. That's what we saw. That describes the picture, that describes the p-value that we got. That's what we're looking for. The second sentence is always, so then what do you believe? If we think it's rare and we were rejecting H0, that means we're kind of picking H1. So we'll say, we have enough evidence to believe that the average miles per gallon for this car is under 30 miles per gallon. That's what we got. That's what H1 actually said. So at this point, we're completely done with this question. If we move to part B, we can see that other types of questions can be asked. Now, what type of error might we have made? Well, again, it's totally possible here that we made a type 1 error because we picked H1, and it's totally possible that we were wrong. Again, the emphasis here, though, is on what type of error may we have made. We don't know if we actually did make an error. The only way we would ever know if we did make an error is if someone could actually tell us what the average is. And that's kind of what Part C is. Suppose that someone comes up to you and they say, I tested all the cars for this particular model. And they found that the true average, the mu that we were chasing, is actually 28.5. Did we make the right decision back in Part A then? If the right average was 28.5 and we said that H1 we thought was pretty good and H0 was crap, if we said we think the average is less than 30, would we be right or wrong if the right answer came out as 28.5? Well, it seems like the correct decision was made because 28.5 is certainly less than 30. Okay, I'm going to pause the video here, or uh, I guess cut the video here, and we'll do example number two in, uh, in the next video.